Okay. Um, just, just say something. Move the chair left. That's good. Okay. I guess just try not to uh, be rad. Flowing southwards from the rocky Simi Hills and the Santa Susana Mountains, the LA River cuts through the city of Los Angeles for almost 50 miles before leaving land at Long Beach. Here is where it meets the Pacific Ocean. Small aqueducts, creeks and channels flow into the larger LA River, with many being built around the same time with the same material. It's that distinct coloured concrete that seems to be an unremarkable mix of beige, white and grey all at the same time. When the sun shines on its concrete banks you can almost feel the heat reflected through the screen and hear vague echoes of old celluloid ghosts underneath the late Sixth Street Bridge. These waterways have become synonymous with LA and the film set here and in the autumn of 1990 two big budget productions would begin their principal photography here both gearing up for a summer 91 release. Two films, each one directed by one half of a married couple, whose movies would go on to release within 10 days of each other and have an impact on action movie cinema for years to come. And it's their complicated personal and professional relationship alongside each individual's own films where this story begins. A story about the city and its river about its directors and its stars. It's 1990 and Catherine Bigelow and James Cameron have been married for a year. Bigelow is coming off of Near Dark and Blue Steel, both films favourable with critics but underperforming at the box office. Cameron's last release was the financially successful The Abyss, which had broken new ground with its computer generated imagery. In the autumn, principal photography would start on both of their own respective films. Bigelow is set to direct Point Break, an action crime film starring Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze, and Cameron will shoot Terminator 2, the sequel to his 1984 sci-fi horror, The Terminator. Both productions will shoot in Los Angeles, the backdrop of the city playing a significant part of each film's overall mood. Now LA is kind of a weird place, it's a place that is both like nowhere else in the US and like everywhere else in the US. It contains nearly all of America's associated geographies, teeming motorways, beautiful beaches, a downtown urban metropolis spiked with skyscrapers and mundane middle class suburbia. Its absence of a notable or definitive aesthetic has over time become its aesthetic. Watching a motion picture set in the city feels both at once familiar and alien. Through its appearance in movies, televisions and video games, LA makes itself feel as if there is nowhere else quite like it in the world. LA is the place where the relation between reality and representation gets muddled, says Tom Anderson. His seminal near three hour long documentary, Los Angeles Plays Itself, goes into much greater detail about the city, its growth parallel to the film industry, which is also known as Hollywood, and its presentation therein. This video will not investigate the actual city itself. Um, I guess for that I strongly encourage you to go check out Anderson's film. 
but we will continue to explore ideas orbiting representation. Sarah Morris's intricately crafted 2004 video piece, Los Angeles, plays on this praxis. A beautifully composed piece set to a score by Liam Gillick, it explores both the exterior of the city, locations, cars, people, and its interiors, the movie making slash money making business, specifically the Academy Award ceremony. It's a chance for us normal folk to see our favourite actors play themselves. For me, the very idea of a city like Los Angeles feels super strange. I mean, the city has no real centre and was constructed primarily around the idea of the automobile, which is what makes it such a great setting for car chases. Scenes can go from downtown, to the river, to the suburbs, and then to the beachfront in no time at all. In somewhere like New York City, for instance, it can take an entire movie just to get out of the city, as it does for the Warriors. So this quick shifting of geographies in LA feels infinitely weird to someone like myself coming from a city like London. Los Angeles has, on many instances, doubled for other cities, London much less so. The British capital has, on rare occasions, stood in for New York. Russia, Shanghai, Madrid, and even fictional locales like Batman's Gotham, the distant planet Xander, and an imperial base. But I can't find an example of London doubling for LA. That particular quality of America's second largest city is seemingly hard to recreate. The closest location that captures not just the flat, south-facing sprawl of LA, but also its aura, I guess would be Old Kent Road in South London. Part of the A2, which runs from Borough all the way to Dover, the Old Kent Road possesses a feel like no other major thoroughfare in the city. A busy dual carriageway lined with enormous versions of regular sized stores, drive throughs a 24-hour supermarket, car parks, and a flyover. The breadth and flatness of it all emotes something extremely LA. You could imagine a car chase similar to those in Terminator 2 or Point Break taking place here. The road is also home to some great places of interest, such as the North Peckham Civic Centre, a municipal development built in 1966 that hosted pantomimes, comedy, music, and also functioned as a social centre. The building wrapped in a grade two listed mural by Polish artist Adam Kososki, which illustrates the history of the Old Kent Road from Roman Britain all the way to the pearly kings and queens of the 1960s. Further down the road lives the Hellraiser bus stop, a rumored portal to hell due to the multiple VHS copies the 1987 movie Hellraiser mysteriously appearing upon its roof. But these stories can wait for another time in another video. Back to Point Break. By 1990, Keanu Reeves was establishing himself as a popular comedy actor and was widely known for playing Ted Logan in the hugely successful Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Patrick Swayze was already a household name due to his roles in the romantic dramas Ghost and Dirty Dancing, and he was trying to break into action movies. W. Peter Eilif wrote a screenplay based on an original idea by Rick King about an FBI agent working undercover as a surfer and then he sold the script to Columbia Pictures in 1986. 
Columbia had originally proposed Ridley Scott to direct, but plans fell through and the production was put on hold. Four years later, Catherine Bigelow was attached to the project. She had married James Cameron in 1989, and the two undertook extensive rewrites of Point Break together. Cameron done such a considerable amount of work on the screenplay that he received an executive producer credit. Keanu and Swayze, who had already worked alongside one another in the 1986 sports drama Youngblood, joined the project as Johnny Utah and Bodie respectively, and production started under 20th Century Fox with a scheduled summer 1991 release date. Bigelow's casting and direction of Rees and Swayze prompts a degree of meta-cinematic reflection that her cinematography encourages further, says Caitlin Benson Allop in her essay Undoing Violence, Politics, Genre and Duration in Catherine Bigelow's Cinema. This is in reference to the two male leads whom at the time could have possibly seemed soft, especially in comparison to their action hero contemporaries like Stallone, Schwarzenegger and Bruce Willis. Point Break slows down and speeds through the usual action set pieces to invite viewers to think about genre conventions and their typical masculine focus on the individual. Slowing down time is something the film repeatedly plays with, giving us time to absorb some of the awful beauty of violence and also to focus upon the male physique. When we first see Tyler, who's played by the excellently cast Laurie Petty, she's diving under the waves, saving Utah from drowning, backlit from the afternoon sun at its zenith, reflecting off the water. It's hard to even tell her silhouette apart from his. Her wetsuit gives nothing away, making it hard for us to initially determine if she's a woman or a man. From Utah's point of view, and in turn ours, we witness how good a surfer she actually is. We're also invited to voyeuristically watch Tyler change out of her wetsuit. An acknowledgement towards the stereotypical male gaze we so often watch these type of action movies through. A balance that I feel Bigelow was trying to upset. Now this isn't a review of Point Break. There's plenty of other videos out there online doing a really good job covering that. So I'm going to assume that you've already seen the movie or you have a rough understanding of the plot. And you know that Utah is an undercover agent infiltrating a group of bank robbing surfers of whom Bodie is the leader. Johnny Utah, an FBI agent who represents and aligns himself with more rigid conservative values, is being lured into a weird, new, hedonistic world through Bodhi, a humanistic surfer whose spiritualism, for Utah, represents danger, radicalism, and to an extent, excitement. Benson Allett goes on to say that Utah and Bodhi find themselves drawn into a violent homoerotic flirtation that raises questions about sexual normativity and the social order Utah represents. Utah's never met dudes quite like this and most certainly not at the FBI Academy. Pull the rip card now! You first! Okay? Son of a bitch! <laughs> Ronald Reagan, whose presidential term had just finished two years previously, is the mask of choice for Bodhi, his own personal politics possibly the furthest from Reagan's, ironically. There's a great chase scene about halfway into the movie, where with this mask on, Bodhi is chased by Utah through what feels like a tour of typical Los Angeles. We start at a busy intersection before a car chase ensues through a shopping mall parking lot 
and into a gas station. Then on foot we go from the busy streets into small alleyways of what appears to be residential back gardens. Only in LA could we jump from the built up urban area to the suburbs in seconds. Reaganism literally running amok in people's homes. The lack of any topological verticality here feels distinctly LA, very different to how chase scenes are presented in other big US cities like say New York or San Francisco. Of note here is that Patrick Swayze was actually not available to shoot these scenes. He was away in Europe doing promotional work for Ghost which had just been released there. His stunt double was used for the entire sequence. Johnny Utah chasing a ghost. Their chase ends in one of LA's most famous locales, the LA River. In actuality, this was Bologna Creek, which flows into the Santa Monica Bay. But to an outsider, the many aqueducts of LA are frequently misinterpreted as the LA River, the largest and most well-known of all waterways in Los Angeles. The river has featured in over 30 movies, most prominently appearing in Grease, Repo Man, Drive, Last Action Hero, To Live and Die in LA, and as the focal storyline in Chinatown. Versions of it appear in video games such as GTA 5 and San Andreas, Cyberpunk, Split Second, and possibly its best representation in the skateboarding game Thrasher. And in this creek is where we find Terminator 2, because as Bigelow was shooting her movie here, her husband was starting production on his own film just uptown a few miles north. And it's here that both individuals in this marriage start to run into trouble, their respective shoots going smoothly, their relationship not so much. After working with James Cameron on the original 1984 Terminator movie and Catherine Bigelow on her 1987 vampire film Near Dark, cinematographer Adam Greenberg was back working on Terminator 2 after coming off of Ghost a year prior. His dramatic shades of blue which were used to convey any faint element of illumination at night were pushed to the extremes in the colour palette of Terminator 2. A cold chrome blue overflows into every scene, so boundless that even interiors can't escape. Even on the poster, Arnie is highlighted in a blue moonlit glow. Almost the entire first hour of the film is blue. Though the new 4K remaster does slightly edge towards teal at some points, it seems that no matter what version of the film you watch, the blue is always there omnipresent, leaking from the screen right into the world and into your room. I've always wondered if Greenberg was ever privy to any insider knowledge on set in regards to Cameron and Bigelow's relationship. At this point you see, rumours were flying of an on-set romance between Cameron and his main lead in the movie, Linda Hamilton. Things would come to a head just weeks after the release of Terminator 2 and Point Break which launched within nine days of each other in the summer of 1991, both halves of the couple's productions fighting for the top spot at the box office. Get down. It's Wednesday, July 3rd, and Terminator 2, at this point the most expensive film ever made, has just been released. It immediately opens at number one at the box office, drawing big money. The following week, Point Break is released on Friday, July 12th. It opens at number four, T2 still holding the top spot. Cameron and Bigelow's films are competing with one another, whilst rumours of turmoil within their marriage are ongoing.
Just a week after Point Break's release, Keanu's other big summer movie, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, opened at number two, pushing Point Break down to seventh place. By August 4th, Big Lowe's film had dropped out of the top 10, whilst her husband's was still raking it in at number two. Cameron's film stays in the top 10 all the way until the end of August, eventually taking over half a billion dollars internationally. Point Break, while still financially successful, takes a much less impressive 83 million. The battle for the big summer blockbuster hit, fought by two filmmakers who were romantically involved, ended with Terminator 2 taking the lead for the majority of the summer, effectively keeping Point Break off of the top spot. Then just weeks later, Cameron and Bigelow amicably divorced. They agreed to stay silent on the matter and have not spoken publicly about the end of their marriage since. Could there possibly have been something more to this, something at play there with their films and their releases together in the summer of 1991? You alright? You look like you saw a ghost. Forget about it, kid. They're ghosts. In his book, What Do Pictures Want?, Professor W.J.T. Mitchell argues that Terminator 2 is the first in a series of 90s releases that inhabit the space between the old world, the biomechanical, and the new world, the cybernetic. The T-100 is a traditional robot made of cogs, gears, and pistons driven by a computer brain. The T-1000, on the other hand, is something new a living metal shape-shifting chimera that is a universal mimic. It's much harder for us to determine what the T-1000 actually is and how it actually works. The two lead terminators here feel like articulations of the shift from the analog world to a digital one, just like how the film itself is famous for its use of pioneering digital effects instead of a reliance on older, more conventional special effects and it was these effects that helped propel the film to being the biggest hit of the summer in 1991. In the early 90s, the action movie genre as a whole was morphing into something new. In the last video, we spoke about how American action cinema of this period was having a kind of an identity issue. Last Action Hero unsuccessfully tried to tackle this dilemma via postmodern self-reflection, producing a film that wavers between parody and pastiche, ultimately becoming the very thing it was trying to satiricize. Terminator 2 and Point Break are signifiers of where the action genre was kind of heading. T2 illustrated and cemented the use of computer-generated imagery in action movies, whilst Point Break showed us that our male heroes needn't be muscled up, no-nonsense, violent meatheads, but can actually be vulnerable, compassionate, and possibly even queer. It feels as if these two movies both mark the end of older conventions in Hollywood cinema and the beginning of something new. Both films also share Los Angeles as a setting, but with a focus on different districts and venues. Point Breaks LA features sunny ocean bays, an FBI academy, parking lots, and endless suburban corridors. Whilst Terminator 2's LA is full of busy quadruple carriageways, bland municipal properties, shopping malls, and inner city industry, all bathed in that crisp nighttime blue. One place they do share, however, is the LA River. To anyone not living in LA, the river and its aqueducts seem to behold an almost dreamlike quality. A network of identical looking channels that in movies are almost always dry and desolate, ready for a high speed car chase at any time. Originally a free flowing natural river, the man made elements and its associated waterways were constructed after a series of floods, 
and were completed in the late 1930s. The myriad of different canals and creeks flowing in and out of the larger LA River seem almost endless and repeating in their bland uniformity. I feel that this is what gives them that feeling of belonging to a reverie as opposed to reality. This is also what makes the river feel more akin to a fantasy setting, like a video game, as opposed to an actual real life location. It's distinct lack of idiosyncrasy, which is home to a strictly limited amount of assets, seems to allow one to apparently loop forever and ever. Both films' chase sequences come to an abrupt end here. Johnny Utah re-injuring his leg as he stumbles to the floor, looking over the water at his target. Whilst on his bike, the T-100 looks through the fire at his. Whilst both locations look similar, Terminator 2 was actually shot about 20 miles north in Bull Creek. The entire chase scene was shot over 10 miles of the creek, itself flowing into the LA River further south. The famous jump sequence was a totally different location in Sun Valley, shot at the meeting of the Hanson Heights Channel and the LA Tuna Canyon Lateral, coming together to form the Burbank Western Channel. This is exemplary of how the different sections of the network can be conveyed to an outsider and read as one instead of many different rivers. The concrete estuary which snakes through the city has always looked like some kind of post-apocalyptic wasteland created by a distant civilization and subsequently forgotten about. Everything seems so oversized and dead, like a gutter for a long extinct society of giants. With the way the canal is captured in T2, littered with burnt out relics from a lost past, it would not feel out of sync in the post-judgment day opening setting of 2029. A little research into the history of the river reveals that since the city took control years after filming Terminator 2, the canals have been well maintained and preserved, clean and devoid of character, the perfect environment for a filmmaker to project their hopes and fears, their ambitions and anxieties. the ultimate, you gotta be willing to pay the ultimate price. It's not tragic to die doing what you love. In 1997, James Cameron married Terminator lead Linda Hamilton. Their marriage lasted just two short years and produced a daughter. Catherine Bigelow has gone on to have a great career, compiled of contradictions. Her movies following Point Break, Strange Days, and K-19, The Widowmaker, were both big budget productions distributed by 20th Century Fox and Paramount, yet both totally flopped at the box office. Whilst her 2008 film, The Hurt Locker, a modest independent production, was a huge critical and financial success, winning her Academy Awards for Best Picture and Best Director. When asked about the rumours that surrounded Cameron and Hamilton during the production of Terminator 2 and if they started dating then, essentially initiating an affair, Cameron has said, Oh no, obviously not. We got involved right after, but, you know, dating an actor during filming is a rule I will never break. Well, I'm happily married now and I'm going to be for the rest of my life, but that is a rule that you cannot break as a director. The lasting effect of the film in down in the hard concrete bed of the river, in the early evening just before the sun sets, the sky turning pink, red and purple, when you can still feel the last warmth of summer cruising on the wind, and a choir of cicadas chirp into the hot air, there was certainly some romance there, there must have been. Maybe Cameron just fell in love with a character he had created seven years prior someone whose life was strictly limited to the pages of the script, to the grain of celluloid and to the pixels of a screen, someone who just wasn't there. I like to think that there's an alternative movie universe where in October of 1990, John Connor and the Terminator managed to catch up to Johnny Utah who's still writhing in pain, unable to walk. 
They help him up and continue through the creek, all the way down to the Pacific Ocean. Much like a marriage, the LA River provides an assurance from the forces of the untamable world, a space where something wild can be controlled. The LA River still flowing its centuries old route, yet now tempered by human engineering. It's also a place where something magical can happen, a blank in which to cast upon. A car chase, a fight scene, a shuttle landing, or even a roller skate jump. A sight that is once familiar yet alien, adhering to nature's chaotic map while simultaneously stuck in a formal rigidity. Dull yet compelling, indistinctly monotonous and extraordinarily dreamlike. So this was my second YouTube video in this format. I would like to thank everyone that watched, commented and shared the first one. Feel free to comment and leave any feedback. A full list of references and citations is available in the description below. I'm currently working on a third piece which will explore how screens and cinema have come to possess an esoteric, almost ghostly presence, acting as a gateway from our world to theirs. But until then, thank you for watching. I'll see you real soon.